Praise the Lord and welcome. On behalf of our pastor, Suffragan Bishop C. Sean Tyson, thank you for joining us here at Calvary Ministries International for our midweek manna. My name is Minister Daphne Ann Carter Hawkins, and I would like to invite you to hit those share buttons and like buttons so that someone can tune in to what's going on here at Calvary. Our announcements for Tuesday, December 13th, are as follows. We're continuing to pray for all those uh, that have bereaved families during this holiday season. The Adult Sunday Academy has resumed in person at 9 o'clock here, 9, 9 a.m. here at Calvary. Tonight's Bible class will be replayed at 7 p.m. on the YouTube channel. Thursday, December 13th, will be our Hot Meals ministry, and that is from 4 to 6 p.m. Saturation prayer and, this, and sanctuary prayer will be from 6 to 7 p.m., followed by small group ministry at 7.15 p.m. Friday, December 13th, Celebrate Recovery will be here from 6 to 7 p.m. And reminders, our Christmas service will be Sunday, December 25th at 8 a.m. And now this morning, we are blessed with a very dynamic young speaker. Someone, has someone who has downloaded into so many of us down through the years, whose life shines God's light. And now I would like to introduce to you today our instructor for this noonday manna, Minister Joe Moss II. Amen. Praise God. Praise. Greetings and praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's just such a great honor to, to be here once again today. And I just want to humbly come before you know, the foot of thy throne in grace today and just excited about just this opportunity. God has been so good to us. He has been better to us than we could have ever been, been to ourselves. And sometimes, you know, we, you know, we live life and we don't always give God all the honor that he deserves. But, you know, it's worth trying. It's worth trying. It's worth giving every little bit that we have to God so that he can get the exaltation that he needs. I want to welcome online viewers today, those that are out there that are watching from the comfort of their home, maybe from work, um, whatever it may be. Maybe you plugged it in and got the HDMI cord in and you got it plugged up on the big screen. But whatever it may be, I just want to welcome you to Midday Mana here at Calvary. I want you to type in the contact, uh, contacts. We love you, Pastor Tyson. Um, we have a great leader of this house, and we're just, just so grateful for, for what God has used them to do and what God continues to use him to do. So we're just, you know, you don't, you don't always come to a place where God has blessed the place with great leadership. Y you don't always find, you know, have the opportunity to connect with people that that serve and, and, and love God like no other. And not only that, he's, 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 he's coupled with his dynamic wife, First Lady Krista Tyson, and we want to give her honor this day as well. And um, so we're just gonna, we're gonna dig into the word a little bit today. And um, there, are, there are so many things that, that God has, that has laid upon my heart to talk about today. And, um, and when preparing for this message, you know, God said, you know, I, I need you to not take the title of necessarily minister who, or whatever today. He said, I need you to be a coach. He said, today I, I need you to, to coach people today. Now, as we know that, that, that through, through Jesus' works, that Jesus was the ultimate coach. One of the things that he did was that he... He led his disciples, not just to be followers, but to one day be leaders. And so no matter how big or how small, with or without a title, you want to be a person that is following Jesus with the intention of leading. Because sometimes we can run out of strength, we can run out of energy, but our mind and spirit is strong. 
and we gathered all this wisdom and knowledge and everything over the years. And so we so we've been through a few things that we can actually share with other people so that maybe they may not have to experience those things themselves. Um, but we want to make sure that that we're always staying in a place of encouragement. Yeah. And that's going to be huge when it comes to this next season that we're entering in. As we know that our pastor, Bishop Shison Tyson, said on Sunday is that you need to be the gift. You need to be the gift. That means that you have to know what it is and you have to have something to offer. And, and, and so we're going to dig a little bit into that a little bit and we're going to be talking about the, the, the rejected the rejected servant. The rejected servant. Because one of the things that will hinder us from doing anything that we want to do is rejection. Rejection. And rejection just means that, you know, failure to, failure to show due affection or not to one's liking or taste, to turn down or to dismiss. And any time we're rejected, it affects our emotions. And, and, and so we can be so full of something that has happened to us that we won't push forward into the thing that God called us to do because of the pain that we feel. And so how are we going to give away something? How can we be the gift if, if we feel that our gift may be rejected? You think about it. If you wrap up a present and you hand it to someone, and you think that, okay, may, they may or may not like my gift, that, that does something to you. And you'll be like, you know what, I'm not giving them nothing next year. <laughs> you know, they, they can't appreciate this gift that, that I gave them. And so, you know, we, we know that, 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 that Jesus, that God himself has given the ultimate gift. He gave his son. He gave his son. And, and we're going to get more into that in a little bit. But emotional pain. Is one is is only one of the ways rejection impacts our well-being. So rejections also damage our mood and our self-esteem. They elicit swells of anger, aggression, and they destabilize our need to belong. Rejection. Has anybody ever been rejected? Has anybody ever suffered from from in a place where they didn't feel like they belonged. And this is, this is huge because it, it, it affects so much about who we are emotionally, it can become paralyzing. Okay, so, you know, and, and one of the greatest damage, rejection um, causes is usually self-inflicted. They are the things that we actually say to ourselves, And so oftentimes it's not because this person over here hurt my feelings or that person over there had something bad to say about me. It's, it's a lot of times the things that we say to ourselves. So if we think about it, you know, when was the last time you did something that you might have fi- felt shame about and you beat yourself up? Nobody else said anything about it. But, but you hear everything you say. You also hear everything that you think. Because all of us can sit here right now, not say a word, close our eyes, and say Jesus in our mind and hear it. And hear it. And so we hear everything we think. We hear everything that we say. So we've got to be careful that if we feel rejected, that we don't inflict self-inflicted wounds. Now, another thing is that it is our natural response to do that, believe it or not. Like, we have to work hard to be positive. We got we to gotta work hard to, to get to the place where, you know, we are saying great things about ourselves, And that's why it's so important to, to know God. Because God will give you an insight of who you are and, who you're, you, and, who you're, and what you're composed of. So that when you start having these negative thoughts of rejection, we can line them up against what, what, is, what, what does God say about me? What, what, is, what, is, what does the word say about who I am, about being a child of God? What, what does the word say? 
And, and so we know that the word is true. And we, but we do also know that the things that we say are not always true. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm standing here and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm talking bad about myself, I'm no good, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm this, I'm that, that's not what God says about you. He says you were fearfully and wonderfully made. He said that you are a masterpiece. And, and, and so, if, so if we know these things, why do we continue to, to if we, when we get rejected, to allow ourselves to go into a state that, that is negative. So we also know that, that, during, that doing it so emotionally unhealthy, so, so, it's really, so it's really emotionally unhealthy for us to have these types of thoughts. And it's very, very self-destructive. Now, it's interesting because, like, scientists have studied the brain. And they figured, because they, they wanted to figure out, okay, why does a person talk negatively about themselves? Or what happens and why rejection feels so painful? And I think we've all been through situations where we felt rejected and then pain hits. Okay, so what they've done is this. So the answer is that our brains are wired to respond that way. So when scientists place people in a functional MRI machine, you know, when you, you know little, little machines that do the electric um, image resonating, okay? Um, so, so, and they ask them to, they ask the person to recall a recent rejection. And so they discover, and then, then they discover something amazing. So the same areas of the brain that activated, were activated um, in the brain when, when we think about rejection, is the same area of the brain that causes pain. And so, so they found out, they looked at the charts and they saw the stimulation where, wow, when, I, when, when we get rejection, when we get rejected, the pain, it affects the same part of the brain that, that pain receptors follow, okay? And so the one thing we gotta do is that we gotta get to the place where we stop self-criticism. So, so if we're talking bad about ourselves, we are not gonna be in an emotionally place where we can give away the gift that God has given us. So if we're supposed to be this gift, and we're fear we're fearful of being rejected of ourself. We won't we won't develop the very thing that God has given us. Yeah. Neither will we use it to help somebody else, Amen. because we're because we don't want to be a part of the pain that's associated with being rejected. Yeah. And we've all had moments like that. So so rejection also destabilizes our need to belong, leaving us feeling unsettled and socially untethered. So, so we're going to set the scene here a little bit. I need everybody to go, through, go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And we're actually gonna we're actually gonna pick this up. We're gonna start here at verse 14. Okay, verse 14. And so this just deals with the these verses just deal with the area of the parable of the talents, which we're all familiar with. And it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man for the for, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered goods to them. He said, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, um, one. And, you know, and he gave it to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on his journey. Okay, so fast forward in the story, the, the person that got the five talents, took the talent, and he, and he was able to go and double it and make 10, all right? And then and that's, where we, that's where we pick up, you know, the, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, for you were faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, there was another one that he gave two talents, and, and he was able to take two and turn it into four. 
And God, and then, and then, then the master said the same thing. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, you're faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Now, there was one that, that had received one talent. And he came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. He said, I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there, look, there you have what is yours. So basically he says, you know what? I was afraid. I was scared. You gave me this, you gave me this one thing. And I took it, and I was afraid that what was going to happen. So here it is. You can have it back. And, and, and so then, he, then the Lord said, excuse me, then his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Verse 27. So you ought to have deposited the money with bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. And this is what happens. He says, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. All right? Now, he says, verse 29 says, for, for to everyone who has, who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness there, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, so my question is, question is, 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 is why did he do nothing with the talent he was given? Was it because he was, he was, he was scared of being rejected? You know what I mean? Like so, so it was just, so here it was that we know he had ability because he wouldn't have been given the talent if he didn't have any ability. Remember, the, the, his, their Lord gave them talent based on what he believed that they can handle. So why, why would he not do anything with the one talent that he had? And, and so it's, it's just, you know, was, what was he afraid of? And so we, we, we so our focus today is going to be on the servant with the one talent. Now we always look at this verse and we see, okay, wow, you know, if I get five, you know, let me let me multiply it. If I get two, let me multiply it. But what about the one? What what could he be feeling right now as a result? of thinking that he was doing the right thing based on his understanding and based on how he viewed the situation he said you know what I don't want to lose of everything that I have so let me just let me just save it and God is not calling us to save what we have so even if you just have one talent one thing you have to use it and you have to use it to help other people. But if we're in a place where we feel rejected and we don't feel like what we have is enough, we're not going to share it. We're not going to give it away. We're not, we're not going to be the gift that we need to be. And so that fear of being rejected, you know, the fear of not being enough, we have to get to the place where we know our worth. How valuable are you? Very. Like, it's, it's amazing because we're, we, are, we are literally one of a kind. There is nobody else in this world that can be a better you than you. Th 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 it doesn't, they don't exist. I would, I would, make, I would be a terrible you. I would be. Because I wasn't born to be you. You were born to be you. Right. you were, and not only that, you were born to be the best version of you. Yeah. 
And so, so as we go into this, 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 this next season, it's that we got to start to pray and say, God, what gift do you want me to share? Oftentimes, we don't, we don't often know what, what gift that we have. But the Bible tells us, especially if we're going to be in a place now where we're going to be teaching, where we're going to be guiding, where we're going to be encouraging, where we're going to be trying to motivate people. You know, I, I was going to gonna skip over, but let's, let's, let's go check this out. Um, let's go to Romans 12. Let's go to Romans 12. I, I think we need to cover this just a, just a little bit when it comes to these gifts that, that, God, has, that God has given us. Um, let's just look at it just a little bit. Um, and so we're in Romans 12. I'm dealing with, I'm in Romans 12. I'm going to be looking at verses 6 through 8. And, th- and so we're in a place now where, where Paul is, is, is describing the seven spiritual gifts um, distributed to different members of the body of Christ. Okay? And so, and, and so we have to recognize these gifts and these talents and, and these resources that we have. And so it's amazing because, you know, any good leader can recognize that and can see and, and, and work to kind of put you in the best position. Okay, so don't 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 come to me and, and, and say, listen, I need you to lead the praise team. That's not going to work. Okay, that that is not it, it's, it's just it's just not going to work. Okay, and it, it's, it's just not. For one, I don't sing. Okay, two, I don't sing well. So and, and then three, I don't know enough songs to be able to follow <laughs> Bishop Tyson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it's just, and that's just kind of how, that's just kind of how that works. And, and so you have to know what your gift is. And you have to know where your talent, to, talent is and allow God to work those things. Okay? I'm going to leave that to my sister Dion. She's the one that, that does that stuff, and she does a tremendous job at it. And that's what we got to recognize when it comes to ourselves. Okay? So, so every resource that God provides should be in use. Everything that God provides should be in use. Every believer is a steward of the abil- of, of is a steward of the abilities that they've been given. So it's up to us to be able to, to, to manage and develop that gift that God has given. So let's, let's just look at the gifts that he, that he gives. Okay, so one, we have the gift of prophecy. Okay, and that's basically people that, you know, to basically that's to challenge others by declaring God's truth and calling for action okay so a lot of times you know get some people you know they get prophetic and they get spooky on us you know what I mean and you know they get real spooky on us and start talking about stuff and you know this is going to happen that's going to happen and 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 now I, I need you to grease my palm but that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day but this is not <laughs> this is not what we're talking about now it's just th- but the challenge is that they challenge people by declaring God's truth and calling for action. Now, now those that are here may remember a few weeks ago when, when Bishop Tyson called me down to the altar. And, and, and one thing, he's, you know, we started prophesying, he started praying over me about the spirit of heaviness. And he talked about how the spirit of heaviness will be replaced with the spirit of rev- revelation and the spirit of praise. And that, that the championship seasons that um, a former pastor, Pastor Locke and I have, have had, that, that his work will be continued. His work will be continued through me. And so, it, you know, so when you, you go home and you try to digest all of that, and you understand, okay, God, you're in control, but I will surrender to what you want. The gift of prophecy is what he was demonstrating in that moment. Now, interesting thing is that those are a lot of those things are things that God has already revealed to me. But what happened was that what he said challenged me to do it. Okay, so sometimes it's just that you need someone to challenge and confirm the word that God is speaking directly to you. And you know it's God, but you're like, okay, I got time. I got time. And I'll take my time. There's no urgency on this. Until someone comes and says, listen, the the time is now. You don't have any, there's no more time to waste. What are we waiting for? 
Another spiritual gift that he leaves is, is the gift of service or ministry, which is to serve others and meet their needs. And so it's, this is not about a title. Okay, this is not about taking a test. This is not about being credentialed in, in, in any way. It's a gift. You, you can provide a service wherever you are. It, 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 and that's, that's what we're trying to get people to see. Like, it's, it's, it's not about, okay, well, you know, as soon as my, you know, my, my credentials come in, as soon as I pass the test, now I'm going to go be a minister. No. Minister. You know this word of God? Share it with somebody. No matter who it is, share it with somebody that's hungry. And there's enough people out there that are hungry for the word of God. And how do we know this? Because they're turning to other things. You know, they're, they're, searching out, they're, they're searching out different ways to fulfill a void that only God can fulfill. Sometimes it's witchcraft. Or sometimes it's a half gospel. What, and, and so we, we got to get to the place where we have, to, we have to be able to share more word. It's not about your title. It's about what you do. Another one is the gift of teaching. And this is to explain truth so that others can understand and apply it. And so, you know, if you think about it, Jesus did a lot of teaching. When he walked this earth, he took three years teaching as much as he could to his disciples. And we, what we have to understand is that they didn't always get it. And they walked with him in person. So, so you have to understand, like, you know, give yourself just a little bit of lean way here. As we strive, we're, we're striving towards the mark. We may not get it the first time. We may not give it the second time. But our focus needs to be on that very thing. Another one is the gift of exhortation. And that's to encourage, strengthen, and inspire others to be their best. Now, we, all, we can all do this. That, you know, something as simple as a smile and have a great day. You never know how far that can go. I remember back in 2009, I started this, this text message ministry. I call it that. And I used to send out these messages to people just to encourage them. And at that time, you know, you, know, it, you had to literally, you could only send it to like 10 people at a time. And then, you, you know, then it would load up. And then you had to, because, you know, the, you know iPhones and smartphones were just kind of hitting the market. And that's where we were. And so I would get up, and it would take me literally 20 to 30 minutes to be able to send out text messages to, to, to 100 people. But I would just, as God would give me the message, I would go and I would send out these text messages. Now, sometimes I would hit the wrong number. And, you know, people aren't very kind <laughs> when, when you get a wrong number or send out a wrong text or something in that regard. And I'm thinking to myself, like, all I did was I sent you a message about Jesus. And then, <laughs> and then I get all these explicits back. Like, what did I do wrong? And so it, that can be a little bit discouraging at times. And, it, you know, and, and sometimes you don't, even get any, you don't even get a confirmation back saying that person received the message. And we're all guilty of it, where someone sent a message, we read it, and we thought we, re we, thought we returned something, and we didn't. And, um, and then they're, they're sitting kind of like ghosted on the other end. But anyways, so there was, there, was, there was one day in particular that I sent out this text message. And at the time, my brother Jared was living in Chicago. So he would take the messages, and he would send out the encouraging message that I sent him to all of his friends. Okay? So he had a friend down in Texas. His name was Tony. And Tony would take the messages, and he would send them out to his friends. Okay, so this thing became this traveling, traveling thing. And so Tony sent him messages. Tony had a friend in L.A. and also a friend in Atlanta. And so the, the friend in Atlanta was, was in a situation where he was dealing with a patient, and the patient was getting ready to commit suicide. And so as he's, as, as, the, as the guy in Atlanta is, is, is helping this patient, his phone buzzes. And he opens it up, and he looks at it, and he said, ma'am, do you mind if I read you this message? So he goes and reads the, reads the message to the lady. 
and she instantly changes her mind. And, 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 and the, the point I'm making is that you do not know how God is going to work. I didn't know the lady. I didn't know the, I didn't know the guy that presented the text message to the lady. I didn't know the person that sent him the message. What I'm saying is that something small that you may think may not be a big thing, do it anyways because you never know how God is going to use it. You could literally be in a grocery store talking to one of your relatives about God. Somebody third in line hears it. And now all of a sudden they're encouraged based on a conversation you were having. So we just never know what God is going to do. And we may never know. But that moment, for some reason, God shared that with me. So what happened was that the guy in Atlanta calls the guy in, in, in Texas, Tony. And Tony calls my brother, and my brother shares the voicemail with me. Yes, sir, yes. And so from that moment on, from 2009, I vowed, I said, God, you know, every day, I will encourage at least three people. Just because you never know how God can use that and who it may help. You may never meet that person. But the gift of exhortation, being able to encourage people. Another one is the gift of giving. To generously share what God has given. Now, some people are just in a position where they're favored and they just know how to make money. They're just, they just know how to do it. Doesn't matter what situation you put them in, you can, you, you, they know how to make money. There are some people, they just, they just know how to, how, they know how to, how to lead. They know how to love. They know how to do various things. But what all I'm saying is that if, if you've been gifted with the gift of being able to give, share it. Share it. Share it. No matter how big or how small, share it. Because, it, because, we're, because that's a gift in itself. And if, and if we want to make sure that, that we share this gift. And, and that's, and it's, it's, you know, but we hope people are appreciative. But sometimes it, they're not. Um, and, I'll, and I'll leave that alone. I'm going to leave that one alone. Um, but also the gift of leadership, which is to govern and oversee others so that the group moves forward. Yeah. Now, like I said, when we first started, we've been blessed with tremendous leadership in this house. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's just who would know what to do based off of the transition that happened 12 years ago? Who would have known? God knows, okay? But he needs, a, he needs a servant to work through that will be obedient and love people through the hurt and the pain and the process. Yeah. And number seven is the gift of mercy. And that means to empathize with, cheer, and show compassion to those who are hurt. Now, there are some people that are tremendously great at this. Very, 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 very good at at living, reliving moments and helping people through tough, tough times, okay? And um, Sister Lynn Phillips is one of the ones that is, that is tremendously blessed at that gift. And, and she's among others, okay? She's among others, but she just happens to be a funeral director, and that, that kind of works well with that. But anyways, so, did, so, so you, you can find something on this list. You can find something on this li list to begin to develop. And be able to share with somebody else. Now it doesn't have to be all together. Just do the best you can with what you have. Amen. And that's it. Because we, 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 are, we are all in a place we are, where we are constantly developing. Like none of us, none of us have, have made it to the place where we're ultimately going to be. And, and since that we're all unique and we're all different. And we're all God's masterpiece. Only you can do what God called you to do the way he called you to do it. But the challenge we run into, that we'll look to the left, we'll look to the right, and we won't see anybody doing it like we envision it. Well, you know what? Maybe it's not supposed to go that way. Maybe you're supposed to be the one that steps out and someone sees your courage. And that becomes courage. That becomes a way to encourage somebody else 
So we have these gifts, these seven gifts that God gives us. And, and, and find, find one of them. Now, some of us are multi-talented. Now, remember, the gifts are given according to your ability. Now, we, when we were talked about the parable of the talents, is that do not take your gift and bury it. You run, you put yourself in jeopardy of God taking it away or just lying dormant to the place where it's just not used. And anything we leave dormant begins to dilapidate. You can take a parking lot that, that, that no cars drive in. Now, all of a sudden, five years later, you got grass and weeds growing everywhere. How is that? You can take a house that's not lived in, and next thing you know, if it's not lived in for 5, 10, 15 years, it begins to fall apart. Why is that? There's something about life. There's something about life. So we got so so the fear of being rejected and experiencing pain from it prevents us from giving ourselves as a gift. So we got to make sure we get to the place where we are we are confident enough in what God has given us to share this gift. And and not not be in a place where ah oh, I'm going to be rejected. Am I, am, because, like, if you're, if, because it, the one thing I, I don't understand is this. If it hasn't happened yet, what are we basing it on? You know, yeah, faith in the, in the positive direction. In the positive direction, yes, faith. But if it's negative, if we're looking at it and say, oh, this isn't going to work. Oh, here we go again. The last year I did this and this happened, or the last time I drove down the street, there was, you know, I was backed up, or the last time I ate this, I had this reaction, or the last. Everything's based on the last time. Everything's based on what happened, something happened previous. And, and until we operate in that faith, Elder Smith, and we allow, we, we push forward and we go, go through the things that we cannot see, that only God knows. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? And so um, let's go to Philippians 3. Let's go to Philippians 3. Hopefully we're getting something out of this today. So you guys, if you, if you don't realize or not that you are loved and you are needed and that you do matter and you do make a difference. So Philippians 3, um, we're going to come down to verse 12 through 14. Now, I'm, I'm New King James Version. Um, I'm going to throw in a couple other versions in there, but I think we'll be able to follow God's word. It says, not that, it's not that I have already obtained it or am, perf or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Then verse 313 says, brethren, I do not count myself to be apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those which are ahead. So if we're, if we're going to reach back, we're going to put ourselves in jeopardy of missing out. Okay, so, so then it says in verse 14, he says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I really, really like what the message version says. Anybody ever read the message version of the Bible? Okay, so I'm going to read that to you and, and so that you can kind of get like just a different, different feel. Okay, and he says, and this is what it says. I am not saying that I have this all together. Or that I have made it. But I am well on my way reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. But by no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal. Where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. 
I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Forward march. Forward march. And then it goes on to say in verse, you know, verses, you know, three through, I mean, verses uh, 15 through 16, it says, so let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Now, there's a big, some big things in here is that God will clear your blurred vision. God will clear your blurred vision. Okay? So it means that you do have sight, but it may not be in focus. And so anytime anybody's, you know, ever been to the, the optometrist, you know, they sit you down in that chair and they bring that device and they start flipping them little lenses. And they'll ask you, what do you see? Can you read that line? You know, some of us can only read the E, but that's okay. That's all right. There's help for that. That's why, that's why we're there, right? That's why we're there. You know, and, and so we, we're, 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 you know, so they ask us, you know, and then he'll flip it. Can you read this now? Can you read it? What line, what's the lowest line you can go to? And then he'll let you see it. Then he'll flip it so that it's blurred. What do you see now? Oh, I can't see anything. It's blurry. And then he'll flip it again so that you can actually see it clear again. And so it says that God will clear your blurred vision. Okay, so this, this, is, this happened. All right, so let's, let's, let's go look at Mark 8. Let's go look at Mark 8 real quick here. Mark 8. Mark 8. So as we're, we're coming on, on Mark 8 here, God is going to heal this, this blurred vision. And so as we, as we pull upon Mark 8, we're going to come down to verse 22. And this, is, this is where Jesus heals the blind man in Bethesda. Bethsaida, excuse me, Bethsaida. Okay, he said, and, and this is what he says. He says, um, then he came to Bethsaida, and, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Now, I find this interesting because he says, you know what? I got to pull this guy out of this environment first. Before I do anything else, I got to get him out of the environment where he's experiencing this blindness. Okay? And so, and I don't know the reason why, but I just, just know that the first thing he did was he grabbed him by the hand and he led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. That's very similar to being at the eye doctor. What do you see? Okay? And then he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. So he could see. But the vision of what he saw wasn't the right interpretation. And it's interesting that Jesus asked him, because, like, if we would have let him go there, everything he would have saw would have been out of perspective. So then he said, then he, then he put his hands on a man's eyes again, made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. And so... It's, it's really interesting because Jesus wanted to know the man's, the man's perspective. Because based off of what he saw, he was going to be able to make the adjustments that he needed. Who touched him? Jesus. Who gave him vision? Jesus. And so a lot of times God will give us a vision, but we got to let him touch it so that we can see it clearly. And put things in perspective of the way he wants it to be. And so one of the things I understood is that back in 2002, you know, I, I, had, a, I had an encounter with God. And, and he was basically sharing with me and showing with me that, that I was going, you know, to be 
in charge of the health and wellness in the church. And this is, at this time, I didn't really, I had a degree in communications, and I was sick and tired of school. So based on my perception and what I saw, I went out and I got online and I found the cheapest, quickest, easiest certified personal training certification that I could find. So I ordered it. I got it. I sent it off. I passed the test because you could use the book, you know, and, you know, and, and open book test. Right. I told you the easiest. Okay. And so the next thing I know is that now I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm all equipped now. I'm ready to go. I got the certified personal training certification. And then crickets. Nothing happened. And I couldn't figure out why. And I said, God, I said, I don't understand why this isn't working. You told me the vision you gave me was about health and wellness. So I went and got a certif certified personal training certification. And then he came back and said, you didn't come back to me with the next instructions on what you were supposed to do. You need to know you did that on your own. You need to know that I am God. So check this out. So I go and God said, OK, God was like, all right. He pointed me in the direction of this master's program at Slippery Rock University. Now, you got to understand that for this master's program to get into this program, there were four prerequisite classes that I have not taken. And also, they wanted a related degree. My degree was in communications. So I didn't have the related degree. There were four classes that I needed to take. And God said, okay, this is what I want you to get. And I'm like, okay, Lord, how are we going to do this? Because it's not lining up. I don't understand. So I emailed, I, I, would, I emailed, I prayed on it, and so I ended up emailing the, you know, the, the missions department. And I sent out an email saying, listen, you know, I, I need these classes. I want to, I mean, real, and I'm, and I'm looking to pursue in this degree, but I, I don't have everything that, it, that I need in order to get into this program. Next thing you know, they sent back an email. And they were like, you know, they were like, Mr. Moss, thank you for your concerns. He and they said that this is what we're going to do for you. He said, we are going to waive two of the classes that you need to get into the program. And while you're in the program, we're going to let you take the other two classes. So I'm thinking to myself, like, this is really, this God has got to be you. Because how are you going to take, let me take classes that I need to get into the program while I'm enrolled in the program? And then it gets better. They said, we are currently working on a graduate assistantship for you that is going to pay for your education. And so not only did, did I get the master's degree in exercise science, they also, get, they also paid for the education. That is God. And this is what happened when you let him touch you again and give you clear vision and put you in the right perspective. He gave me the vision. He said, yes, health and wellness, that's what it is. But when it came down to my interpretation, just like the blind man of Bethsaida, he saw a man as trees walking or men walking as trees. He saw him as trees. I saw, listen, health and wellness, get, certif get a certified personal training certification. And God said, no, 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 no. I need you to see clearly. And so at the time, I didn't know how, the, how this thing was going to play out. So, so, you know, that turned into an internship. And I started working as an exercise physiologist for this orthopedic surgeon. And I, and I did that for five years. And then that led to being strength and conditioning coach for a high school in Pennsylvania. And then that led me over here to open up Blessed Body Fitness. Okay, but, but here's, here's the deal, that God knew that it was going to take more than what I saw. He knows what it is that you need, and, but we have to trust him. And so it, although sometimes it may look impossible, although it may look like, I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to get into this program. What if God said this is what you need to do? Trust him. 
No, we're, we're real good at, at telling other people to trust God, believe in God, have faith, all this other stuff. But when it comes time to our own individual faith, we, we get a little shy. It, like, like God is going to reject us. You, or do, you, do you really think God would bring you this far to leave you now? You, you've been walking with God long enough to understand that God is going to show up. But we got to do it the way that he wants us to do it. You know, you, you know if, for those that watch the, the, you know, the, the 5 a.m. prayer with First Lady Tyson, no, when that clip, when that thing ends, you see a clip of Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church, and you, and you hear Bishop Tyson, you know, talk about, you know, whatever you do, stay with God, right? Stay with God. And so when you hear that, Staying with God doesn't just mean being saved. That means can I keep pace with God? Can I run the route that he wants me to run? If he wants me to take a left, God, let's take this left together. If he wants me to take this right, let's take this right together. If he wants me to speed up, God, we're going we're gonna to accelerate this pace. doesn't matter what type of condition I'm in right now, but we're going to go because I trust God. And this is where we got to get to. We, we got to get to this place. Where we are, we are trusting God and we allow him to touch us so that we can see this vision clearly. So what do we do now? What do we do now? You know, you know, you know, so, you know, what are, what are, you know, what are we going to do? What are we not doing? Okay. With the, you know, because we may have the fear of being rejected. So there's, there's something in our life right now that we know that God is calling us to do it. But because the fear and the pain that comes along with being rejected, we're not doing it. And, I, and, I, and I, you know what? And I'm willing to, to believe that what God is calling you to do has something to do with your gift. Something to do with something that he's given you. And, and, and that gift is supposed to be a present for somebody else. But if we're living in a place but we fear the fear of the pain of being rejected becomes stronger than the gift that we're supposed to give. We won't do it. And so all I'm saying today is that whatever God tells you to do, do it. Do it. Be encouraged to do it. Understand that there is no one like you you are the only you that exists. And there will never be another one of you. And God knows this. So just like he had plans set for me that were beyond my sight and understanding when it came to graduate school, he has plans set for you that are beyond your sight and beyond your vision and beyond your understanding that he wants to do for you. But you got to do it got to do it if I didn't email the person if I didn't believe the believe that it was even a possibility if I wasn't trusting God the whole way here was something that God had for me would have never received now the, the other part of the story is this fast forward to now um, I've connected with YSU um, YSU's exercise science department and they have a lot of students that need internships in the exercise science. They also need. A, they also have a lot of students that need job shadow. Not, not job shadow. Yeah, but the shadow of someone that's in the field. Now here's the interesting part. They have a requirement, and the requirement that they have is that you have to have a degree in exercise science to be able to do it. Now the challenge is that you have a lot of trainers out there. They don't have degrees. They have certified personal training certificates, but they don't have degrees. So here it is that God is using me now to help a lot of these young students in the field. But if it would have been left to my own interpretation, I'm looking at all the people that would not have received what God is using me to do. And so I'm saying is that the importance of doing it the way that God has called you to do it. Stay at God's pace. 
Stay, stay, stay doing it the way he wants you to do it. And don't worry about the fear of rejection. Don't worry about it. Everyone's not going to like you. If you don't know this by now. I know all of us got at least one person that doesn't like us. Okay? I mean, <laughs> some of us got more than that. Some of us got some enemies. But the, the, the point I'm making is that, like, we should know now that rejection does hurt. Okay? So just because it hurts doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. God is not necessarily concerned with how you feel about what he wants you to do. And, and, and so, you know, so we got to get to the place where that we don't reject God by not doing the thing that God called us to do. The be- one of the best gifts that God has ever given, you know, comes from John, you know, 316. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, we got to get 17. People just leave it at 16, but we got to get 17, 17 too, Elder Smith, right? <laughs> for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God, God gave his only begotten son, knowing that there were going to be people that rejected him. And there were people that will continue to reject him. He gave his gift anyways. And all I'm saying is that as men and women and children of God, we need to give our gift regardless of, whether or not we believe it may be rejected by somebody else. You have something that you can offer. You have something that you can give. You have something that can, that can serve a great benefit and encourage somebody else. It is not too small. Not if it comes from God. It, it, it's, just, it's just not. So stay encouraged in everything that you do. And so we want to get to the place where, you know, some of us, that we never want to reject Jesus. Never want to reject Jesus. And although he gave his son, that we can, but we can only be saved through him. So we're required. You know, some of us say, oh, you know, we already... You know, Jesus already died for all of his sins. Turn up. No. No, 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 no. We're only saved through him. Only saved through him. And I leave you with this. Don't reject him. Because when it's time for him to come back, you don't want him to reject you. Father God, we come before you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we thank you once again for this great day and how you have kept us and how you have watched over us, Lord. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, Lord. Lord God, we thank you for this word that you brought forth this day. God, we thank you, Lord God, for each and every saint and person that you have in this building today, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to be able to discover our gift. Help us, Lord God, to be able to develop our gift. Help us, Lord God, to be able to share that very gift that you've given unto us to be able to present to other people, Lord. Now, Lord God, we honor you. And if there's anything dealing with rejection that we're feeling, Lord God, help us to get through it. Help us to get through the hurt, Lord. Help us to get through the pain, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to be able to to, to, to get over it in our mind, Lord God, so that we can get rid of that that bitterness in our heart, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Everybody is carrying something, Lord God. And we understand that, yes, it's tough. It's challenging. But we know that that we may not have been, we may not have made it yet. But Lord God, help us to remain focused on that going in that direction that is leading us towards the goal and towards the prize. Now we honor you, Lord God, and we thank you, Lord God, once again, just for this opportunity to be able to humbly come before you. We honor you, Lord, and we strive to do better. We we commit ourselves to do better 
and to be better so that we can help someone else get better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.